There's a famous saying from the times of the Cold War. There is no sex in the USSR. First spoken during the teleconference between the USA and the USSR in 1986, it created an explosion of laughter among the Western crowds. The laughter that drowned out the end of the phrase. There is only love. That said, despite the popular myth, sexual and social life in USSR were always booming. A lot of families at that time were created because some poor student was willing to push his luck and save some money on contraceptives. People were dating like everywhere else since, according to my grandfather, it was the best thing to do at the time. You might think that in a country so strict and regulated that there were no prostitutes, in de jour you would be right. Back in 1937, Stalin proclaimed that in a successful country that is on its way to building communism, women have no need to become prostitutes like in capitalist countries. And then, single-handedly decriminalized prostitution, believing it to be the thing of the past. It was probably an ideological step, but as usual, the propaganda was very different from the reality. The prostitutes were still very much a thing. It didn't mean that the police didn't know about them or ignored them. Prostitutes were often arrested for things like being caught drunk in public places, indecent behavior, and other things. But none of those charges were serious, and very quickly, they would roam the streets again. But the fact that they were getting away almost scot-free didn't mean that they were fine with being held in jail, even if for a few days. So they were always looking for ways to avoid the careful, ever-present eye of a Soviet policeman. One such way was to team up with taxi drivers. Ever since the first taxi driver started roaming the streets of Moscow, looking for people in need of a quick ride, they were always known to be the go-to people when it came to illegal activities. They were not above secretly selling alcohol and contraceptives to couples they were driving which effectively made them entrepreneurs, and thus criminals in the eye of the state. And if you wanted to find some contraband, drugs, or a prostitute, a taxi driver was your guy who knows a guy, with the condition that he was going to drive you there at a triple price. My grandfather was one of such taxi drivers, and according to him, he was making a fortune on such endeavors. He was actively going out of his way to locate possible clients for his female colleagues. A couple of drunk students on the eve after an exam, looking to keep their party rolling. A well-dressed man with a lost look on his face coming out of Leningrad Rail Station, who would come from another city on a business trip, and who could use an opportunity to spice up his sex life without his wife ever finding out. And the creme de la creme, a foreigner coming out of a hotel, an in tourist, a hotel reserved only for guests from abroad that the USSR found influential enough to lift the Iron Curtain for them. Journalists, diplomats, and sometimes even royalties, they were the perfect clients. They were always open to meeting an exotic, silent but seductive stranger in a cold, distant land. They didn't know the prices and, most importantly, they were rolling in money. Of course, in tourists always had their own share of prostitutes flocking around it, like small fish around a shark wanting to feast on the leftovers. These girls were high class, the best of the best, beautiful and mysterious, most of them speaking good English, albeit with a strong accent, and they were straight out of a James Bond movie, which, to be honest, wasn't even far from the truth. All of the women worked with KGB who knew all too well that men physically couldn't keep their tongues in check after a good sex, and could sometimes unintentionally spill some highly classified intel. So while in tourist was a profitable spot, there was nothing to catch there. The competition was just too harsh. But one June evening near the sundown, as my grandfather was slowly driving by the hotel, he saw just what he had been hoping to see. A young foreigner, somewhere in his mid-thirties, gently refusing the offers of a scantily clad woman as he was passing by. The stranger. My grandpa wasn't sure if the man was his client or not. Perhaps the stranger was simply not into hooking up. 
but Grandpa decided to test his luck anyway. He rolled down his window and shouted the few English words that he knew. Hey, good girl, not expensive. Go? It was a risk to do so. If there was a policeman within the earshot of him, my grandfather could be arrested for procuring. But luck was on his side. The stranger smiled and jumped into his car, and my grandpa peddled it. The stranger smiled, said a few words in an unknown language, and stuck his head out the window to enjoy the incoming breeze. What girl? My grandpa asked the stranger while they were driving. Blonde, brunette, redhead. He was listening to the words he knew, realizing that his vocabulary was quickly coming to an end. Big tits. He remembered another word combination which was always making the foreigners excited. I want authentic. The stranger suddenly spoke in broken Russian. Authentic Russian girl. Those girls back there, same as home. I want a normal girl. Racy girl, racy place. That can be organized. Grandpa smiled, switching back to Russian as well. I'll get you the racy one alright. An authentic experience to remember. He stopped near one of the payphones, jumped out, and quickly called one of the dozen phone numbers he had memorized. Ira, get ready. I'm bringing over a client in 10 minutes. A foreigner. He informed the other side as soon as he heard the phone being picked up. Mind your tongue, Georgie. I have gas. What if my mother picked up? He heard the girl hiss at him. A few seconds later, however, she mellowed out. A foreigner. It's too good to miss out on. Is he going to be alright with the takeout? He said he wants an authentic experience, so it's your lucky day. My grandpa informed her. Be ready in 10 minutes. We'll come pick you up. With that, he hung up and rushed back to his car where the stranger was patiently waiting. Of course, grandpa could call many other girls, but Ira was the best one of them all, and they really wanted his passenger to be impressed. And since the stranger had said he wanted an authentic, racy experience, he would be pleased with the takeout. To understand what a takeout is, you need to understand that all the prostitutes couldn't bring their customers to their homes every day. Their neighbors would inevitably start to complain, bringing the attention of the police. So, the work from home was reserved only for the rare occasions when no other options were available and the client was willing to pay extra. The cheapest and most affordable option was a takeout, which worked perfectly in tandem with the taxi drivers. First, the taxi driver picked up both the customer and the girl. He then took them to the forest outside of Moscow, where he parked on the side of the road in the shade of trees. The cars were sacred ground. No sex was allowed there as no one wanted to clean it up after. So the taxi driver would hand the horny pair a blanket with which they would proceed into the shadows of the forest to do their deed under the starry sky. Grandpa said he had two or three good books with him to kill some time, as well as a never-ending stock of cigarettes, so the wage wasn't that bad. You would think that many clients would be against shagging the forest like some dirty animals, but in reality, the opposite was true. People loved doing it in the wild. It helped them reconnect with their primal roots and added some spice into the process. A flavor you couldn't find in the city, unless you were brave enough to do it in a park. And so my grandpa was sure that the stranger would enjoy it as well. It was the most authentic experience he could present to him. They had to wait for Ira for five more minutes. Not a long time, but with each passing minute, grandpa was becoming more and more worried that the stranger would lose his patience. Finally, he saw Ira come out of the building and sighed with relief. The wait was worth it. Ira was a real beauty, or at least according to Grandpa, who almost blushed when he was describing her. Young and fit, always smiling, with adorable freckles and a mane of red puffed up hair, the top of fashion back then. She was wearing a denim jacket on top of her summer dress, a rare piece of clothing for those times, imported from abroad and resting on her chest. And hanging from a massive, intricately designed chain was a large amulet in the shape of a scarab. That cursed thing. Grandpa always swore whenever he remembered about it. That cursed, idiotic trinket. Back then I had no clue. 
not a slightest idea of how much it would mess my life up. Back then, he really didn't know any better. When he saw it, he couldn't help but compliment Ira for having good taste. Oh, you like it? She smiled, fiddling it in her hands. I bought it from Borya, the Fertrovshik. He says it's really ancient. Came from Egypt to France and then here. I had to pay a fortune to have it, she explained, coiling the amulet's chain around her finger. But this little thing just wanted me to own it. Fatravshiks were people who were trading with imported goods. To understand how dangerous it was, you have to know two things. Imported goods were usually contraband and entrepreneurship was banned across the USSR. So, if you were caught selling foreign contraband from your home, you could be sent away for a really, really long time. But it was the 80s. The Iron Curtain was getting laxer and the Soviet people who had already had the taste of foreign goods were willing to pay crazy money to have them. French makeup, VHS players, vinyl records of Jimi Hendrix. Some old timers still say with regret that the USSR hasn't collapsed. It was sold for a pair of jeans. Ira got into the back of the car where the stranger immediately wrapped his hands around her. She smiled into his mustache and Grandpa took off, trying extra hard to focus on the road and ignore the sounds coming from the back seat. After half an hour of driving, he arrived at his destination, a small, easy to miss spot at the edge of the road, where the grass did not grow anymore and the ground was stained with machine oil dripping from the car. He took a blanket from his car's trunk, handed it to the smiling Ira who gave him an excited wink, and watched both of them disappear into the forest darkness. The radio was silently playing some catchy tune about the sea, and the yellow light bulb of the interior lights was the only source of light aside from the stars above. The moon was shy that night and hid behind the earth's shadow. Grandpa lit up his cigarette, pulled out a book from the glove compartment, and tried his best not to imagine himself in that foreign stranger's shoes, if he was still wearing them, that is. Around half an hour later, he was startled when the door from the passenger side swung open. He didn't hear them approach, didn't hear any chipper discussions on their way back, which would be a usual thing after Iris' meetings with her clients. No, instead he heard the man panting, heard him jump inside the car, and he heard only him alone. Drive! The foreigner exclaimed. His voice sounded very distressed, and he was constantly looking at the forest with eyes full of fear. Go, go, go! Now! I pay extra! With his left hand, he was clutching the bloodied shirt on his chest, perhaps to keep his racing heart in check, or maybe to tug the clothing closer to a concealed wound. Despite his appearance and the shock he had on my grandpa, my old man still took a second to regain his senses just enough to resist the temptation to follow the man's lead and succumb to fear. Where's Ira? He asked the stranger in a raspy voice. There's your Ira. He pointed at the forest, continuing to clutch his chest with his other hand. The crazy bitch attacked me. I say racy, authentic girl. I say no crazy bitch. I need a hospital. It didn't seem right. Ira could throw quite a temper tantrum but she wasn't one to outright attack people, especially with such violence that it sends them fleeing in fear for their life. Of course, Grandpa didn't know her outside of work, but if he saw how she treats the clients who refuse to pay, then he might as well have seen it all. It doesn't seem right, he grunted, and we're not leaving without her. Where do you say she is? Back there in the forest, he asked, opening the door to step outside. Don't go, the stranger insisted, grabbing him by the sleeve. She's super crazy. She attack you. Better go. He yanked my grandpa's sleeve. I pay a lot. I have money. See? He opened his wallet and showed my old man dozens of green bills, a forbidden yet invaluable foreign currency. The main reason he and I were together on that night. But my grandpa couldn't be convinced. He had to see her for himself to believe it. We're not leaving her in the middle of the forest tonight, crazy or not, he said. I'll go talk to her and then bring her here. You stay put. Uh, no, don't. The stranger tried stopping him one more time, 
but Grandpa yanked his sleeve out of his hands. Get your freaking hands off me. The foreigner had no chance but to submit. Turning on the high beams, Grandpa climbed out of the car and headed for the forest. The car's beams were flooding the edge of the forest with light, but Ira was nowhere to be seen. When they took the blanket, they took it beyond the bushes, away from the prying eyes. That's where he headed. Ira! He called for her, pushing the bushes aside. Despite doubting that she would attack him, he was still careful, almost as instinct. What if the stranger was telling the truth? What if she really mauled him? And if she really was so bloodthirsty, would she stop when she saw a familiar face or attack him as well? But why would she? And then for some unexplained reason, he remembered her amulet. It was the only thing new about her after all. Grandpa didn't believe in anything supernatural, but could it be that the amulet had some secret compartment with drugs in it? A compartment that the previous owners forgot to empty before selling the amulet. A compartment that could have been opened when two bodies thrashed against one another, spilling its contents into her face. It really felt like he was tracking a starved beast. Grandpa was hoping for the best, and yet he was straining his hearing, ready to hear the branches snap under the heels of Ira's fashionable boots. Ira, he whispered quieter than before. A bit more into the woods, and the light of his car beams wouldn't be able to reach him anymore, leaving him in total dark. Would he really want to hear her coming towards him then? Perhaps it would really be better to go back to his car. He pushed another bush aside, and the shadow that was concealing Ira crept away, presenting her to the light. And there she was, her dress and denim jacket completely red from blood, and yet it was pretty obvious that she wouldn't harm the man, or anyone for that matter. She was dead. She was lying on her back with her hands spread out in a shape of a cross. Her summer dress was pulled back all the way up to her belt, with its edges smeared in blood, and her panties were around her left ankle. But since the dead had no shame, she remained like that for everyone to see. Her neck and chest were covered in blood, and her scarab amulet, her prized possession she cherished so much, was now almost swimming in it. Grandpa leaped to her to see if she was perhaps still breathing, but nothing. She had lost too much blood to still be living. Driving her to the hospital would be pointless as long as saving her was a concern. But when he leaned over her, desperately trying to notice a faint breath, he spotted a few more details. For starters, Ira's hands had no blood on them, so the stranger's version that she attacked and mauled him was already falling apart. The thick chain of her amulet had left a purple imprint on her neck, and not just on the back of it, but on the front as well. The man involuntarily raised his hands to his mouth when he realized that Ira's favorite trinket was the thing that was used to abruptly end her life. And yet, if she was strangled, then where was all the blood coming from? Judging by the pattern of how the blood spread, it seemed that the wound was on her neck, yet the amulet with its thick chain was obstructing his view. He pushed her treasure trinket to the side to get a better look at the wound on her neck, and he froze. Perhaps Ira was indeed strangled by her own amulet's chain, but now it seemed that it was done only to subdue her. For the unmistakable bite mark in the shape of human teeth on her neck indicated that the killing blow was done afterwards. The last bit of puzzle finally landed in its place. The edges of Ira's dress were bloodied because they were used to wipe the killer's mouth and hands after the man was done. Grandpa jumped to his feet and turned around to see that the foreigner wasn't in his car anymore. He stepped out of it and stood in front of the beams, casting a gigantic shadow on the forest. There were no signs of him being distraught anymore. He stood there in full confidence, with his head held high. Grandpa could see only the man's silhouette, highlighted by the car beams, yet he understood what the man did. He wiped some blood off his shirt with a thumb, and then he suckled on it. His head slightly rolled back in joy as he was enjoying the last bits of his meal, like a toddler who wasn't yet trained in proper etiquette. 
And then, as if to mock the very concept of death, that stranger, that godforsaken man from enigmatic lands, who had been heard speaking in unknown language, and who had killed his victims by sucking their blood out, spoke in perfect Russian, in perfect female voice. Come back to the car, Georgie. I told my mom I went out to see a friend for only an hour. She must be worried by now. There was no mistake about it. It wasn't just a female voice. It was the voice of Ira, speaking about the events the stranger could have no clue about. He was too shaken to move, and so the man started walking towards him instead. He was moving with perfect confidence in his stride, with absolute certainty that he could take on another prey and come out victorious. So Grandpa ran away. He rushed through the forest, leaving his car and Ira's body behind. He ran through the darkness away from his pursuer, not even bothering to look back if he was being followed. Until many hours later, he happened to stumble upon another couple. He says that the man got startled and started threatening him to lock him down if he told anyone he had seen him there with a prostitute. So he must have been some high-ranking party officer, but Grandpa paid him no attention. He headed straight for the taxi driver who had brought them there. Taxi drivers in Russia always had a keen sense of solidarity. So when my grandpa emerged from the forest, tired, with blood on his fingers and fear in his eyes, and he listened to him. He used the radio to call the dispatch and inform them that there had been a murder in the forest. Only when the police came to the crime scene, they didn't find the man, only the car and the body, as well as the bloodied amulet with its chain's elaborate pattern matching the bruises on the victim's neck and Grandpa's handprints all over it. Handprints from the time he, concerned with Ira's health, moved to decide to take a better look at the wound. No one had seen him pick up the stranger near and tourist. On another day, Grandpa would consider it a great luck. He also didn't inform the dispatch about that as he wanted to pocket all of that money to himself. Another grievous mistake. All in all, the detectives didn't believe his story and didn't care that he was the one who called the police, considering it to be a weak attempt at creating an alibi. They had a crime, a suspect, a victim, and most importantly, the murder weapon which tied everything together, the bloodied amulet. As for the motive, unrequited love. Ira's neighbor said that they often saw her emerge from his taxi, often enough to remember him. They suspected that he wanted her all for himself, and when she refused, he killed her in the woods. The case was ready in a record of two days and passed to court, where Grandpa, by some sheer miracle evading a death sentence, got charged with murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Worst of all, my grandfather believed the police. Her husband, whom she had loved so much, turned out to be a cheater and a killer of horrors. In a moment, her entire world turned upside down, and it took him 20 years worth of letters from prison to convince her that he didn't do it. Despite working with the prostitutes, despite liking Ira and blushing when he saw her kiss another client, he always remained loyal to his wife, and so her unbelief was the most damning thing for him. He is free now, although he has served all 25 of those years. I wasn't yet born when he was incarcerated. So, it was strange suddenly having another father figure. We get along surprisingly well, so he often shared that story with me. I was always skeptical whenever he got to the part where the man started talking in Ira's voice, but I always let it slide. The man was very old and endured quite a lot, after all. He passed away one week ago. I was among one of the last people he spoke to. The night before his death, before his heart gave out to knock the wind out of him, making him fall headfirst on the hard floor, he told me that story one more time. Only that time, he decided to finish it with a cryptic message for me. A message that is making me question what I really knew about him. Sometimes the biggest stranger a man meets is the beast that dwells within him.